Hello, this is uh, Brother David Martin, pastor of the Solid Rock Baptist Church in Bartlett, Tennessee, in the Memphis area, and uh, we're glad that you tuned in today to uh, listen to our uh, broadcast and watch our YouTube video. On this subject today, we're going to talk about the sinner's prayer and sinners praying. The sinner's prayer and sinners praying. Um... The following uh, letter, a part of a letter that I'm going to read to you, is the standard criticism that genuine born-again Bible-believing Christians uh, receive from uh, uh, a lot of Church of Christ people and many evangelical, or some that is, evangelicals and fundamentalists. Uh, there's a controversy over this particular thing, and we're going to address that today. Um, some people refer to uh, the sinner's prayer as part of what's called an ease believism kind of salvation. And uh, then uh, there, uh, on the other side of that is what's called lordship salvation, uh, where they seem to think it's hard to get saved. Um, and uh, there's a happy medium there. There's a balance there. And um, I believe that I have that balance, and I'm going to try to share uh, my thoughts on this with you, and hopefully it'll make sense to you. Um, you take uh, the self-righteous sinner who's trying to get to heaven on his own merit, will do anything and argue any point uh, to avoid a personal encounter with the Lord. Um, many times these kinds of people, their religion is formalistic, it's ritualistic, uh, it's one that preaches a works-based salvation, and uh, it promises a possible salvation to those who adhere to their formula and mind their rules and obey their rituals. Um, not all that are against the sinner's prayer believe that necessarily. I believe there's some that don't believe in the sinner's prayer per se, uh, that preach the gospel and folks get saved under their ministry, just like they disagree with us and the so-called sinner's prayer and uh, folks get saved in our ministry. Um, so, and of course, some people would disagree with that, and that's fine. It's a free country. You can believe what you want. Um, but I want to read you part of a letter here that I received that kind of uh, prompted me to uh, write an article to put on our webpage, and then uh, I'm basically going to share that article with you today. Uh, here's the letter. This person writes to uh, our website, Solid Rock Baptist Church, and to me, the pastor, and says this, Hi, I just happened across your website and saw this, and then he quotes part of our webpage article on salvation. And um, part of it is under the heading Sinner's Prayer. And under that I say, ask the prospect, that is the person who you're dealing with about Christ and salvation, ask that person to take your hand if they mean business. Uh, then lead him or her in a prayer like this. And have him repeat or her repeat after you sincerely from their heart. And here's the prayer. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, died to pay for my sins and save me from hell. The best way I know how, right now I receive your son, Jesus Christ, as my personal Savior. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I pray in your name. Amen. That's the prayer. Now, this is the man's comment. Who was it that came up with the concept of a sinner's prayer. I don't recall the Bible saying a sinner has to beg God for salvation in prayer. I do read that if a sinner believes, then he should repent, confess Christ, and be baptized, and I'll pronounce it like they do, and be baptized in his name, and that salvation is gladly and freely given to those that do. Is this not true? Well, that's a whole other issue, the Church of Christ, but it's not true. Water baptism does not save you. It uh, has no part in your salvation, but again, that's another video and another lesson. Um, he says, is, is this not true? Well, he says this, that's what my faith in Christ and his word led me to do. That is to believe, repent, confess Christ, and be baptized in his name. It led me to doing this. And in doing that, it gave me assurance of my salvation and a clear conscience. Now, he belongs to the Church of Christ. And he says that doing these things uh, 
get, gave me an assurance of my salvation. Well, since they believe you can lose your salvation, I don't know how in the world they can offer you any assurance of salvation. Uh, none of them know where they go, are going to go when they die, even though they've repented, confessed, believed, and been baptized. They have no idea if they died tomorrow, they'd go to heaven. Uh, a saved person knows that, or can know that. They don't know that. Yet they profess, and this man professes it, that he knows he has assurance of salvation, and yet, honestly, he doesn't. Um, you, you engage him in a conversation, you'll find out he doesn't know that. Uh, he believes if he lives right, if he believes he goes to church every week, if he believes he takes the Lord's Supper every week, so on and so forth, um, and lives a good life until the day that he dies, then he'll go to heaven. So his salvation is based in his works, no matter what he says or professes to believe about it. But in any case, they have a real issue with the so-called sinner's prayer, okay? And so we're going to talk about that. So to answer the question, uh, we're, go of course, going to go to the Scriptures and see what they say. And it's going to be quite apparent that our critic here, who I'm assuming is an unsaved man, um, either he missed these verses uh, in his Bible reading, and if he came across them, then he didn't understand them, because the Bible does say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, that if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, that is the unsaved, in whom the God of this world, that's the devil, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. That is, believe not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as given in the Bible. Now, until a person's heart turns to the Lord, uh, the spiritual blinders remain over that person's spiritual eyes. And the Lord won't reveal anything to somebody who doesn't believe his word. Now, I believe a lot of these folks are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong when it comes to the doctrine of salvation and the assurance of salvation and eternal security and even how to get saved or be saved. But we're going to examine this as we go along here. Um, the Bible does say that if a person refuses to believe the gospel and re refuses to believe the word of God and reject Christ, that uh, the Lord will send them strong delusion, um, that they should believe a lie that they might all be damned who believe not the truth. So God will send delusion to folks, a strong delusion, uh, that they might be damned. Uh, that's what God says. That's God's attitude towards those who don't believe him and take him at his word. So it's very important that we take him at his word. And again, a lot of these folks are sincere, but they are just sincerely wrong in their interpretation of the scriptures. Um, they don't believe in salvation by grace, many of them, and those that do believe in salvation by grace and are against the sinner's prayer are a group of uh, uh, professing Christians who uh, believe that a person has to repent of their sins, which I believe you have to do that. Um, but they, for some reason, they seem to make salvation hard, and, and I don't quite understand that. So in any case, if that's you, I uh, hope you'll listen to the rest of this and maybe you'll learn something. But anyway, um, moving on here. Until a, until a person is born again, uh, he can't see, he can't perceive, he can't understand the things of the kingdom of God. The Bible said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, that could be a literal seeing of the kingdom of God when he goes to heaven. Or it also could be a reference to perceiving or understanding the kingdom of God and the things of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says the natural man uh, doesn't receive the things of God. He can't understand the things of God. He can't know the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. So an unsaved man, he's in a natural state. He's not regenerated. He's not born again. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit. And so uh, unless God shows him, and I believe God shows every man who wants the truth, uh, salvation by grace, but many people uh, don't understand because they're just not saved. And a lot of them will rest the scriptures to their own destruction uh, and uh, to the destruction of those who listen to them and follow them if they are resting the scriptures and twisting the scriptures. Uh, they use the scriptures, but they twist them. Um, now, with that introduction, let's see what the Bible says 
about the concept in the Bible of what we what has been referred to as the sinner's prayer. Now, honestly, I don't know that I've ever re referred to it on my own as the sinner's prayer, um, but people who are critical of it and object to someone praying to get saved uh, call it the sinner's prayer, and they say it in a way that uh, sounds derogatory and demeaning and um, you know, just trying to make people feel guilty for using it or whatever. Um, but, of course, the term now, sinner's prayer, doesn't appear any time in the Bible. Uh, but I believe the concept is there, and we're going to look at that and see what the Scripture says in regards to that. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pretty simple verse. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever means anyone who. That is, anyone who shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the unsaved sinner. And then it says there that the word call is used there. What's that word call mean? Well, um, it means to call out to God. And the only way I know how to call out to God is in prayer, whether it's silently in my, from my heart or whether it's uh, verbally with my voice. Uh, the only way I know how to call out to God is through prayer. And so here we have prayer by another name. So here's a person who calls upon the name of the Lord. And the Bible says there, they shall be saved. Now, saved simply means to have your sins forgiven so you uh, don't go to hell and to receive eternal life and Christ's righteousness so that you can go to heaven. That's basically salvation in a nutshell. Um, so it looks to me that if a sinner was to call upon the name of the Lord, God would save him, according to Romans 10, 13. So my question is, what do you think? I did it. It worked for me. Um, now, the prerequisites for salvation are in the previous verses of the same chapter. And so we're going to read the passage in Romans 10, verses 9 to 14, to get the context. And here is Romans 10, verse 9 to 14. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So, Verse number uh, 9 and 10, uh, we see there that salvation depends on a person confessing the Lord Jesus, not his sins, but confessing Christ as Savior, and believing with his heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, to believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead implies you believe he died on the cross, and he died for your sins. So, we understand that when we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in the, our hearts that Christ raised from the dead, we understand that he died for our sins, and he rose again for our justification, the Bible tells us in Romans 4, uh, 25. And so a person who does that can be saved. So if you'll confess the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, uh, that means he died on the cross, and he rose again for you. If you'll believe that, then you'll be saved. Now, verse 14 tells us this, How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? In other words, somebody's got to preach the gospel to the unsaved. Somebody had to preach to you. Somebody preached to you in a church that you attended. They preached to you in a Sunday school class that you attended. They preached to you on a, uh, from a street corner as you were driving by. They preached to you in a in uh, some, uh, some downtown area where you were walking by. Uh, somebody gave you a gospel tract. A friend of yours witnessed to you. But somebody got the gospel to you. You may have heard it on television or the radio or the internet, but somewhere, someone got the gospel to you. You weren't born knowing it. Uh, you're born knowing who God is or knowing that God exists, and you have an innate belief in a God when you're born. Um, and as time goes on, 
you probably accept the Bible to be the Word of God and you believe it. And at some point, uh, somebody has to preach to you from that Bible the gospel of Jesus Christ. You hear, you hear, you've heard it someplace. That's if you're saved, you have. And if you're not saved, you probably heard it too. This may not be the first time you've heard this, but in any case, um, verse 14 there tells us that there's got to be somebody to preach the message, to tell the message, um, and then it says they can't believe in somebody they've never heard about, so they got to hear about Christ. Um, and then he says this, the very first part of the verse, how then shall they call on him who they've not believed? In other words, if you call on the Lord, Romans 10, 13, then you're doing that because you've believed. That is, you've already believed. Where? In your heart. What does verse uh, 10 say? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confesseth man to salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you are inclined to pray and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save your soul by calling on him, then God will save you if you're trusting what he did for you on the cross. Um, and again, you've got to know who he is. You've got to know about him. And you're not going to sincerely, genuinely call on the Lord to be saved unless you've already believed in your heart. Okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that more just now. as we go on here. Um, if you believe unto righteousness, according to verse 10, you're going to be saved. And again, you might even call upon him. And if you did, you'd be saved. Romans 10, 13. Now, a person can put their faith and trust in Christ as Savior silently um, in his heart. Because it said in verse 10, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And that's the issue. Or simultaneously with his heart, in believing and his mouth through prayer, he can be saved. Um, and again, for our Church of Christ, brethren, water baptism has nothing to do with it. It's found nowhere in this passage. Um now, the psalmist, King David, said this in Psalm 55, verse 16. As for me, I will call upon God. Now, what do you think that means? Sounds to me like he's praying. I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. David says, I'm going to call upon God, and he's going to save me. What, as a response to him calling upon him? Why did David call upon him? Because he believed that God could do what he called upon him to do. And God does that for him. Um... Now, he said that God would save him if he called upon him. So, there's a sinner calling on God and being delivered, rescued, saved. Um, is it a sinner's prayer? Well, uh, there's no suggested words, but it says if you do pray to God, he will save you. Um, you can supply your own words if you want to, as long as it's from the heart. God will hear and answer and save you if you call upon him. That's what David said. He should know. I know because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ at one point in my life, and when I prayed to him to save me, I believe that he did, based on Romans 10, 13. How about you? Have you called upon the Lord in repentance and faith, and has he saved you? I hope that he has, and if he hasn't, then I hope that you will trust Christ as your own personal Savior and call upon Him to save your sinful soul and give you eternal life. Um, now, David quotes the Lord in Psalm 50, in verse 15, where God says this, And call upon me in the day of trouble. So if you're going to call upon God, again, what are you doing? It's called prayer. God says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Again, Psalm 50 and verse 15. So God says if you call upon him in the day of trouble, he'll deliver you. Now I'm going to apply this evangelically, or evangelistically here, if you will. And that means that he's going to save you. The day of trouble is that season in which the Spirit of God works in your heart to convince you that you're a sinner who needs God's forgiveness and that Christ is the only way of salvation. The Holy Spirit of God deals with your heart, your mind, your conscience in such a way that you're troubled at the thought of dying and going to hell and not being able to go to heaven. Uh, that's God working in your heart. Uh, that happened to me when I was a 17-year-old high school kid in California. Uh, I called upon the Lord, and he saved me before I ever stepped into the baptistry or joined a church or took communion or any of that stuff. Um, 
My question is, has that happened to you? Have you called upon the Lord? Has he saved you? Uh, I hope he has. If he hasn't, then again, I hope that you'll call upon the name of the Lord and be saved tonight, today, this week. Um, now, let me say this. Mouthing the words won't save anybody. Mouthing the words of a prayer doesn't save. Uh, the prayer must be from the heart, and as such, it must be sincere. Uh, in the book of Psalms, 145, verse 18, the Bible says this, The Lord is nigh, that means near, unto all that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. So again, it has to be sincere. Uh, one time I mouthed the words of a prayer that two soul winners led me and my buddies in while we were sitting on the picnic tables uh, outside of the lunch room uh, in our high school in Hanford, California back in 1976. And uh, we all prayed. None of us was sincere about it. None of us called upon the Lord in sincerity and truth or genuinely. Uh, we were just embarrassed, some of us, uh, some of because these people were talking to us about Jesus. How embarrassing can that be in high school? Um, and uh, some of us were, some, some of them were snickering and laughing under their breath. And when these guys left, and they thought they just led four or five high school kids to Christ. I can imagine they went to church that night and said, hey, we led five of them to Christ today. Uh, I'll guarantee you that five, none of us got saved that day. Now, me personally, um, I felt guilty when I prayed that prayer. I wasn't laughing. Uh, I, had, I had a fear of God. Um, I believed the Bible was the Word of God. Um, I didn't understand it all. I didn't understand all the doctrines of the Bible, but I had a fear of God and thought the Bible was the, was the Word of God. And so I don't know who Jesus was. Um, and uh, I knew he died on the, on the cross for me to save me and all these things. But uh, I wasn't under conviction to the point of getting saved that day, so I just mouthed the words. And so I wasn't saved, even though I was led in a sinner's prayer. So you, people say, well, you're preaching a sinner's prayer. No, I'm not. I don't believe the sinner's prayer can save anybody. I believe you're saved by trust in Christ. But... If you pray to the Lord, he said he will save you, and you wouldn't do that sincerely unless you'd already believed in your heart under righteousness, Romans 10, verse number 10. All right? So now, the concept of a sinner praying to God to be saved, is it in the Bible? I would say yes, it is. Um, are there literal examples of a sinner praying to God to be saved? And I would say to that, yes, there are. Um, I believe that there's two examples in the Bible, in the New Testament, of sinners praying and getting saved. Both of them are found in the book or the Gospel of Luke. Um, the first one is the parable of the publican and the Pharisee, uh, familiar to many people. And it's in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. And there we read the story, Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. I'll read it to you. And he spake this parable, that's Jesus, spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous, or self-righteous people, and despised others. Most self-righteous people do look down their noses at other people. Some of you are watching this right now, and you're so self-righteous, you're looking down your nose at me, uh, because you're self-righteous. Uh, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Uh, the publican was a tax collector. Uh, he was the scum of the earth back in that day there. Uh, he was a Jew who was uh, taking advantage of fellow Jews, and he was despised by many people, uh, by most. And so here you have a Pharisee, a very religious man. Here you have a publican, a sinner. Uh, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. That's kind of funny, isn't it? Uh, he didn't pray to God. He prayed with himself. Uh, he said, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Looking down his nose at him, of course. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, here's the sinner, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says this, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, that means saved, right with God, 
rather than the other. For every one that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. Uh, there you see the self-righteous religious Pharisee bragging to God of his goodness and his morality, which he's counting on to get him to heaven. Um, think of the former uh, New York City uh, mayor, who's now running for president in 20, for the, the 2020 election, Michael Bloomberg, who said that uh, he has earned his place in heaven. Uh, well, he's wrong about that. He hasn't earned his place in heaven because nobody can earn their place in heaven. Jesus did that for you because you can't do it yourself. So Mr. Bloomberg is a lost man who's not saved. I don't care what church he belongs to or how many times he's been baptized or sprinkled or catechized or whatever it is he's done um, or how much good he's done in the world. Um, he's not saved because you can't earn your own salvation. The Bible's clear about that. Uh, salvation's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to God's mercy that he saved us. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 tells us that very clearly. But anyway, you see, in contrast to the self-righteous Pharisee, you see this publican who was looked down upon in his community. He wouldn't even look up to heaven when he was there in the presence of God there at the temple. He smote his breast in repentance and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Uh, Jesus said that publican who prayed to God for mercy was justified, and the other wasn't. Uh, the Pharisee's hope was in his works. The publican's hope was in the mercy of God. Uh, the man that got saved in this passage was a sinner who prayed to God for mercy and received it. Uh, he was a sinner praying, and in his prayer, his prayer was a sinner's prayer, if there ever was one. Um, if you were to recognize that you're a sinner, understand that Christ died for your sins and paid your sin debt and rose again from the dead, if you were to believe that and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner like he did, guess what? You'd be justified. You'd be saved. You'd be right with God because you had accepted God's mercy and in the person of Christ in the New Testament. So that's one example there of a sinner praying and a sinner's prayer. And the man got saved and Christ did not condemn him for that. And, and again, in Luke 18, verse 10, let me just emphasize this again. Verse 10 says, two men went up in the temple to pray. And so when this publican looked up to God, and he said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. He's praying, according to verse 10. What was he doing? He was saying something to God. He's talking to God. He was calling upon the Lord. <laughs> and guess what? The Lord saved him. All right, that's Romans 10, 13 in action. Um, now, the second account is in Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. And this is where we see the Lord Jesus dying on the cross between two thieves. And it shows us that there's a sinner there. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to pray. Let's see what happens here. Luke 23, verse 39, starting there down to verse 43. And one of the malefactors, that means one of the criminals, one of the bad guys, one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him. That is, he's, he's uh, trash-talking Jesus. And he said, If thou be Christ, save thyself, and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou, not, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. So one man there doesn't recognize that Christ is innocent. He just thinks he's another criminal. And he thinks he's probably crazy to, to, to um, claim that he's the Messiah and uh, go to the cross and die for something that, uh, you know, he didn't have to. And so this guy's mocking him, basically. Say, well, if you're the son of God, then, you know, why don't you save yourself and us too while you're at it? The other guy says, hey, wait a minute, this guy's innocent. He didn't do anything wrong. We have. We deserve to be hanging on this cross. But this man in the middle, he doesn't deserve it. And so he rebukes him for that. And he says, we deserve what we get. That's a sinner recognizing the fact that he's a sinner. Um, and he says this. He said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He's carrying a conversation with Jesus, who is God manifest in the flesh. You know what he's doing? He's talking to God. 
He's praying to God. He's calling upon the Lord right here to do something for him. He's saying this, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So apparently he believes. Um, and Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, A sinner's prayer can't you do any good. What are you doing calling upon me right now in prayer and saying a sinner's prayer? What You expect me to answer that? Romans 10, 13 hadn't been written yet, but Paul is quoting Joel in the Old Testament, which many of you knew. And it said the same thing that Paul said. Same thing that Peter said next too. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice he said, Lord. He recognizes who he is. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, when he was doing the best way he knew how, he was saying, Lord, would you please save me and take me to where you're going? Because I don't want to go to hell. And the Lord said to him, he said, Verily I say unto you, this is what he really said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The Lord said, Okay, I accept that. I accept your prayer. I accept your request. And uh, yes, I'll, I'm going to answer that. Why? Because whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. David said there back in Psalm, uh, I was referred to a while ago, 55 verse 16, I think. Uh, he said, I shall call, I'm shall i going to call on God, and he's going to save me. So this man did that. It's a sinner. It's a sinner praying. And he prayed the sinner's prayer, if you will. Um, now, one of the thieves, the repentance one, said, again, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. So that sinner understood he was a sinner. He was repentant. He was sorry for what he'd done. And uh, he knew that the end was near. And uh, he called upon the Lord to save him. And the Lord said that he would do that and that he would be in paradise with him that day. Um, so Jesus heard him. He answered him. And he assured him that he was going to be with him after death. So this man got saved on the cross by praying to the Lord. And again, water baptism has nothing to do with it, uh, just to point that out to our Church of Christ friends. And let me just say this, um, those who do believe that water baptism is necessary as a part of salvation, um, they'll say, well, you know, he was in the Old Testament and water baptism for salvation is required in the New Testament. Well, let's look at this again here. Um, this man here, he died under the New Testament, not the Old Testament, because he died after Christ died, putting him into the New Testament dispensation. So he was saved in the Old Testament before Christ died, but he himself dies in the New Testament, under the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 14 and following says this, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve a living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death on the cross, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And he goes on to say this in verse 16 and 17, for where a testament is, we're talking about the New Testament, where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now the testator is referring to Jesus Christ. And for the testament, the New Testament, to be in force, uh, he has to die. And so this thief on the cross... Um, ask the Lord to save him before Christ dies. Therefore, he's in the Old Testament dispensation. Then Christ dies. After Christ dies, then these men die. So they die in the New Testament dispensation. And so for those who would say that in the New Testament dispensation, you must be baptized to be saved, this proves that's not true. He had no opportunity to join a church, to take communion. He had no, cho no, no uh, opportunity to be baptized. He's hanging on the cross. He's about to enter eternity. And so he actually uh, enters eternity um, in the New Testament dispensation. That's just a side note. Now, I'm going to close by saying this. Jesus had to die to bring in the New Testament. And so he dies. He brings in the New Testament. And New Testament salvation is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ who came 
uh, lived, suffered, died, bled, and rose again uh, almost 2,000 years ago. Uh, believing on Christ, believing on his name, is what brings salvation. And again, Romans 10, 9 to 13 is very clear about that. Now, we see from the scripture, I believe, in these two examples, particularly uh, the publican and the Pharisee in Luke 18, uh, the dying thief in Luke 23. I think it's very clear there um, that the concept of the sinner's prayer is in the Bible, whether you call it the sinner's prayer or not. Um, and there are examples of sinners praying and getting saved, like Romans 10, 13 says, and just like the verse that he quotes from Joel 2, the same thing, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Um, in, jo in Joel chapter 2, I'm not, I'm not, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 2, uh, those who believe that salvation include, uh, that is, baptism is a part of salvation. Um, he says there clearly, he quotes Joel, Peter does, and says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So again, salvation is by calling upon the Lord in faith. Before you ever get in the water and get baptized, before you ever join a church, um, because uh, salvation, again, is by grace through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast like Mr. Bloomberg and any other self-righteous Pharisee that could be listening right now who thinks you're going to heaven because you're a good person or you're a good man or a good woman or whatever it might be. Uh, the Bible said there's none that good. There's none good, no, not one. The Bible said there's none that doth good, no, not one. The Bible said all of us sin come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, you need God's righteousness, and his righteousness is Christ. And you've got to receive Christ to have the righteousness to enter heaven. And you won't do that until, unless you repent of your own self-righteousness. Uh, the, 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 th the two men on the cross, the two thieves on the cross, one was repentant, one was self-righteous. The publican and the Pharisee, the Pharisee was self-righteous, the publican was repentant. That's the difference. Um, and the question is, which one are you? You're one of the two. Um, now, I'm going to close by saying this. A preacher friend of mine uh, commented on uh, one of my posts uh, regarding this. And um, he explains it this way, and I agree with this. I think this is right. Let me read you what he said. He said, by the time a person prays the, quote, sinner's prayer, he's already saved. When he moves his hand to put it on my New Testament, he's saved. Or if he takes my hand or steps out of his seat to come to the altar or any legitimate invitation to receive Christ, once he does that, he's saved. And what he's saying here is this. He's saying, for instance, if you're dealing with somebody and you're witnessing to them and you're leading them to, a, to the point where, okay, they've heard the gospel and they need to make a decision. And what you do is you take your Bible out. This is what he's talking about. And you say, okay, if you, if you, excuse me here, if you, where's my Bible at? Um, there it is. It's there. There it is. Okay. I'm sorry. But anyway, um, you say to them, you say, okay, if you believe the gospel, if you believe what I've just told you, and you want to receive Christ as your personal Savior, if you mean business about that, I want you to do something. I want you to take your hand and place it on my Bible. Now, what's that doing? That's a legitimate invitation. Will you receive Christ? If you will, put your hand on this Bible. If you receive Christ as your Savior, would you take my hand? And then you can lead them in a prayer of assurance of salvation. Um, and the idea is to let the Lord deal in their heart. Uh, we're not trying to press you to proceed. We, we're, 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 we're not pressuring you. We are trying to encourage you to be saved. We are trying to ex exhort you to be saved. Um, but we can't pressure you into being saved. That's something you have to do. I can't make you, I, I, can, I can lead you in a prayer. And if you're still resisting the Lord, again, you're just mouthing the words and Nothing takes place in your heart. You don't get saved. So when you reach out and take a person's hand, when they say, if you'll receive Christ, take my hand. And uh, when they do that, if they are honest and they're genuine, then what he's saying is they're already saved at that point. Why? Because they believed in their heart. See? Now, let me read again here what he says, and then it'll make more sense. By the time a person prays the sinner's prayer, he's already saved. I agree with that. When he moves his hand to put on my New Testament, or again, takes my hand, or steps out of the seat to come to the altar, 
whatever the legitimate invitation to receive Christ is, uh, when he bows his head to pray, then the deal is sealed. Um, the words of the prayer are just a benchmark in his memory so that he can remember this event. Even so, I lead them in a prayer that dots every T and crosses every I. I lead them to admit that they're a sinner, that they deserve to go to hell, uh, that they are sorry for their sins, repentance, he says in quotations, um, that they are trusting in the blood of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, it's a newly saved person that is doing the praying. He said it's a newly saved person that's doing the praying. Why? Romans 10 says again, how can they call upon him? That's the sinner's prayer, if you will, unless they've already believed, see? Um, because he was saved. Let me say this again here. The person praying the so-called sinner's prayer is a newly saved person that's praying because he was saved when he decided to accept God's free gift of salvation. Where did he decide that at? In his heart. With the heart, man believed unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confessions made unto salvation. So we could say this, and we do, that if a person has decided in their heart to trust Christ as their personal Savior, the prayer, the sinner's prayer, if you will, um, is just simply as he says, a benchmark, something to look back at, to say, okay, here's a point where I know that I personally received Christ as my own Savior. So that when the devil comes to you to tempt you and say, yeah, you can't be saved. Uh, you know, when did you get saved? I, I'll give you a personal example here of something that happened to me, and that is uh, uh, when I did get saved at 17 years of age, uh, I had a Billy Graham tract. And uh, friends had been witnessing to me, praying for me. I was under conviction. And I wanted to get saved this particular night. And so I pulled out this Billy Graham track, and I said, okay, I don't know what to say. I believe, but I don't know what to say. And I didn't understand all this stuff at the time. So I said, okay, I'm going to pray this prayer. So I prayed the prayer in the back of the book, of the tract. I think it's called Steps to Peace with God, I think it was. And so anyway, later on, as I got in church, because i never really been in a good church up to that point, I started hearing preaching. And they were preaching about, you know, all the doctrines of salvation. Salvation by grace, not of works, etc. Repentance, uh, justification, you know, faith, all these things, you know, that deal with salvation. And some of those things I didn't know when I had gotten saved at 17. And so I started kind of wondering, did I really get saved? Did I? And one of the things that bothered me was, did I say the right words? Did I repent enough? Did I believe enough? Did I believe all the stuff I needed to know? And I was confused by that, by some of the preaching I'd heard and some people that had been talking to me. So I spent several years trying to find that tract so I could read the, the words in it. I finally found it, and I wrote them in my Bible. I looked it up and said, okay, it looks like I covered all the bases. <laughs> but you know what? I was saved because I believed in Christ at that point in my life when I was 17. It's not the words that I said. Um, so, again... Uh, do I believe in the sinner's prayer? I believe that a sinner can pray to the Lord if he has a repentant heart and a believing heart. And that if he calls upon Jesus to save him and forgive his sins and give him eternal life, I believe the Lord will do that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So again, I ask you that are watching and listening, um, have you sincerely called upon the name of the Lord uh, with a repentant attitude and a believing heart? Uh, have you trusted God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as your own personal Savior? If you have, then praise God. We're glad that you've done that. If you've not done that, then we pray that you will receive Christ as your personal Savior, that you will trust Him as your Savior. And again, let me say this. Um, the words you say don't matter. Um, what matters is, do you believe in your heart that Christ died for you in your place and paid the penalty of your sin so you can be saved? If you're trusting Christ and what he did on the cross, you're saved. Let me say it this way. Um, people always ask this. They're always concerned about, well, how do you know a person's saved? Well, I don't. All I know is this. All I know is this. Uh, whether you're a lordship salvationist, whether you're an easy believism guy, or whatever, or in between, like I think I'm in between that. Um, the only thing I know is this. If you are at this moment trusting Jesus Christ, God's Son, as your Savior, and you're trusting what he did on the cross for you to save you, if you're trusting him and what he did for you to save you, and not your own works, not your own goodness, etc., if you're trusting Christ and him alone for salvation, 
you are saved. That's all I know. And if you're trusting Christ, you're saved. I hope that you are. If you're not, hope that you will. And uh, again, Romans 10, 13 says, whosoever, that means you, if you're not saved. If you'll call upon the Lord, you know what he's going to do? He's going to save you if you put your trust and faith in him. Again, the sinner's prayer can't save you. It's not praying that saves you. It's trusting Christ as your personal Savior. If you've never done that, I hope that you'll do that. God bless you. Hope you have a wonderful day and even better eternity. Good night.